Hello and welcome back to Wednesday Night Bible Study here at the Peyton Fourth Chapel Christian Church. I'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Our great God and Heavenly Father, today we thank you for your great love. Father, we thank you for the many blessings you give to us every day. Father, today I pray that you would open our hearts and our minds and our eyes and our ears as we consider your holy word. Help us to put it to practice in our daily lives. Uh, give us the wisdom uh, that you alone can supply through the truth of your holy word. And Father, as we understand what Christians went through in the past, Father, make us, uh, may that strengthen us today for the task that we must do. Father, we thank you most of all for Jesus, and it's in his most precious and holy name that we pray. Amen. <clears throat> We've been studying the last part of the book of Acts, uh, sort of one story. It's Paul's uh, story about his travels from Jerusalem to Rome. And as we look at the story, we see the events that uh, transpired uh, to begin the journey from Jerusalem. And we look at the things that are going to happen along the way. And today we're still in the middle of the thing that um, brought about his whole uh, trip to Rome. The, the thing that gets him from Jerusalem to the city of Rome. And we're still in the middle of the beginning of that story. And of course, we know there was a controversy. Paul was told to go and uh, participate in a vow with some other men at the temple. And when he went into the temple, he was accused by uh, Jews from Asia of bringing Gentiles into the temple, which he didn't do. But that caused a big ruckus. And then the Romans got involved. And then uh, Paul asked for permission to speak to the crowd. And we're right in the middle of his speech. He asked the uh, commander of the Roman soldiers if he could address the crowd. Of course, he asked him, him in Greek, and the uh, Roman commander is surprised that he speaks Greek. The Roman commander supposed him to be another man who was a rebel, uh, who was an Egyptian. Paul wasn't. Uh, he explains who he is to a degree, and he gets permission to address the crowd and he begins by telling them about his background and where he's coming from. And um, as he talks to them, at first, they're quiet. You've got to remember that what, uh, what was going on was that the Roman soldiers were trying to carry him into the barracks away from this rioting crowd because they were upset uh, because people had accused Paul of taking Gentiles into the temple and so he asked the commander if he can speak to the people and he does and he explains to them a little bit about who he is that he's a jew he was uh, born in tarsus uh, raised in uh, jerusalem studied under the feet of gamaliel uh, trained in their faith uh, zealous for the god of their fathers and he told about how he too at one time was a persecutor of the way. And the way is the term that he was using to describe uh, the Christians, whom the Jews would have described as a sect of Judaism. And how he persecuted the followers of the way and how he had them arrested and sometimes had them put to death and was consenting to their death. And how he even received permission to leave Jerusalem and go to other cities in order to persecute Christians there. And that's his sermon up to this point. He is sort of identifying with the audience, with these uh, the, the Jews here that were involved in this mob violence. He was sort of trying to build a bridge to establish common ground with this unruly mob. And so he begins his uh, sermon there. He begins the message. He begins the speech by establishing common ground and explaining uh, who he is, a little bit about his background and a little bit about his personal views on the uh, doctrine that he now ascribes to. So that's the beginning. Now in verse 6, he starts to talk about his own personal conversion experience. Remember the old song, I saw the light, I once was so aimless, a life filled with sin, 
and I wouldn't let my dear Savior in. And the chorus says, he, they, I saw the light. Well, Paul, in this uh, text, this, this is where this experience comes from. Paul literally saw the light. And he begins to describe the experience that he had on the road to Damascus. Now, you remember, he was going there with letters from the chief priest to go and extract the Christians from the Jewish community there and bring them back to Jerusalem uh, to be tried for their belief in what he called the way. So he was actively on a mission against the early church. And he tells his story. He begins in verse 6. So we're going to read down. Um, let's see. I'm going to read down to about verse um, 13, uh, verses 6 through 13. About noon, as I came near to Damascus, suddenly a bright light from heaven flashed around me. I fell to the ground and heard a voice say to me, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? I asked. I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting, he replied. My companion saw the light, but did not understand uh, the voice of him who was speaking to me. What shall I do, Lord? I asked. Get up, the Lord said, and go into Damascus. There you will be told all that you have been assigned to do. My, my companions led me by the hand into Damascus because of the brilliance of the light had blinded me. A man named Ananias came to see me. He was a devout observer of the law and highly respected by all the Jews living there. He stood beside me and said, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very moment, I was able to see him. Now, um, let's go down to verse 16. And then he said, The God of our fathers has chosen you to know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear words from his mouth. You will be his witness to all men of what you have seen and heard. And now, why are you, what are you waiting for? Get up and be baptized and wash uh, your sins away, calling on his name. Let's stop there. Okay, so Paul talks about his conversion. Now, in the book of Acts, uh, Paul's conversion is told three times. In chapter 9, we are told about it uh, through Luke, uh, writing about the account, uh, and here Paul gives a first-person account of what he went through, and again later on when Paul is on trial in the book of Acts, in chapter 26, he repeats the experience again and gives the account again while he's on trial. So we see the conversion of uh, Saul of Tarsus three times here, in the book of Acts. And he begins, uh, as he begins the uh, description of what happened to him, there are some details in the story here that we don't have uh, when we look at chapter 9. We're going to go back and look at chapter 9 a little bit. We're not going to look at chapter 26. Uh, we'll talk about that when we get to chapter 26, but we might go back and look a little bit at chapter 9 as we go through here. But he gives some details here in chapter 22, that, that Luke, as he writes the story, as he writes the story about Saul's conversion in Acts chapter 9, doesn't give. So as we look at all three of these conversion accounts, we can flesh out the entirety of what was said and what happened. One of the facts is that he talks about it uh, being at noon. He said there in verse 6, at about noontime. Now, in uh, chapter 9, it doesn't give an account. It simply says, as he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. Doesn't give a time. Paul gives a time. Now, this is important because when we have different accounts of a story, we can compare and contrast them and sort of flesh out the details of what's going on. And it really gives more substance or weight uh, to the testimony uh, 
when we have these various versions. So Paul here adds a detail about the story that chapter 9 leaves out. He says, about noon, as I came near Damascus, again, he wasn't far away, he was near. Chapter 9 agrees with that. He says he was getting near to Damascus. This is a bright light flashed around me. And again, same thing in chapter 9. It doesn't say there was a deep darkness. It says a bright light flashed around him. So those details are the same. He says, I fell to the ground and heard a voice say to me, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And again, uh, we see the same thing here in verse 4 of chapter 9. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Paul, Paul, or Saul, Saul, rather, why do you persecute me? Now, I heard a preacher a few years ago, I kind of had a funny comment on this, and he said, I think when Paul was laying there on the ground and he asked that question, where he said, who are you, Lord? The preacher said, I kind of think Paul was probably saying to himself, please don't say Jesus, please don't say Jesus, please don't say Jesus. And of course, the voice answered, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. He says, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. Now, one of the things we want to notice about that is... Um, how Jesus identifies with his disciples, okay? Uh, he asked that question of Paul both ways there in, in those chapter 9, chapter 22. He doesn't say, why are you persecuting my people? He says, why are you persecuting me? Jesus here shows how much he identifies with his people, that when somebody does something, to one of Jesus' people, it is as though they were doing it to Jesus himself. Now, we've got to remember the judgment of the sheep and the goats. Do you remember that parable that Jesus tells about the judgment of the sheep and the goats in Acts chapter, excuse me, Matthew uh, chapter 25? Uh, Jesus talks about this great judgment scene that's going to take place in which God is going to separate the sheep from the goats. And the sheep, he's going to put on his right hand, and the goats, he's going to put on his left hand. And he is going to judge them uh, based on how they treat people, on how they treat certain people. And he says there in um, Acts, or excuse me, in the Gospel of Matthew, uh, chapter 25, uh, beginning with verse 31, the story begins there in verse 31, and in uh, verse 34, he pronounces his judgment upon the sheep. Then said, this is at Matthew 25, 34, then said the king, then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye, blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was a hungered, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in. Naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee a hungered, and fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger, and took thee in, or naked, and clothed thee? And when saw we thee sick, or in prison, and came unto thee? And the king shall answer, and say to them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. And then he pronounces his judgment upon the goats, or on his left. And in verse 42 he says, For I was unhungered, and ye gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me not in naked, and ye clothed me not sick and in prison, and ye visited me not. Then shall they answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee a hungered, or a thirst, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister unto thee? Then shall he answer them, saying, Verily, I say unto you, in so much as ye did it not, to one of the least of these, ye did it not to me. 
Jesus here identifies with his believers. He calls his believers in Matthew 25, he says, the least of these. He says, if you did it unto the least of these, it's, you're doing it to me. If you don't do it unto the least of these, you're not doing it unto me. When he approaches Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus here, he says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Not my people, but he says, why are you persecuting me? It's the same idea that we read about in Matthew's gospel. If you don't do it unto the least of these, you don't do it unto me. If you do do it unto the least of these, you do do it unto me. Now, in Matthew's gospel, he was talking about doing good to Jesus' disciples. Then he was talking also about just withholding good or not doing anything, not ministering anyway to Jesus' disciples. So we see that in the judgment of the sheep and the goats, the sheep are rewarded for doing good to Jesus' disciples. And the goats aren't condemned because they did evil to Jesus' disciples or they actively did something wrong. The goats are condemned for a sin of omission, for the fact that they simply did not do anything helpful to Jesus' people. And Jesus says, if you're not going to help my people, it's like you're not helping me. So in the parable of the sheep and the goats, we see here a sin of omission. Now with Saul of Tarsus, it was different. Saul was committing a sin of commission. See, there are two different types of sins. There are sins of omission, where we don't do the good that we ought, and there are sins of commission, where we do the evil that we ought not to do. And that's what Paul was doing. He was actively committed to the persecution of the church. You see, it's a sin of commission. Why was it a sin of commission? Because he was committed to it. He was committed to persecuting, to actively doing evil to the church. He wasn't passively simply not helping the Christians. He was actively doing evil and persecuting them. And Jesus identifies with these people and he says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Of course, Saul asked that question. Who are you, Lord? And he gets that answer that he was probably hoping he wouldn't get. I am Jesus of Nazareth. Now here in uh, chapter 22, it adds, adds the phrase of Nazareth. We don't read about that in chapter 9. But he says, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. So Jesus confronts Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus. Saul sees a light. He says, my companion saw the light. But they did not understand the voice of him who was speaking to me. Now in the Greek language, this is a good translation. In the King James Version, it says that they didn't hear. Now it would appear, if you look at it in the King James, it would appear as though that's a contradiction. In uh, chapter 22, um, verse 9 in the King James, it says... And they that were with me saw indeed the light and were afraid, but they heard not the voice of him that spake to me. Then if you go back to chapter 9, we read something that sounds different. In chapter 9, in the account of uh, Saul's uh, conversion, uh, chapter 9 down to verse 7, And the men which journeyed with him uh, stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. In chapter 7, or chapter 9, verse 7, it says they heard a voice. In chapter 22, uh, down in verse 9, it says uh, they heard not the voice of him. Well, the NIV translates it, they didn't understand. Now, this is probably a better translation because of the Greek language. There's an accusative and a genitive form of that word to hear. And in other places in the New Testament, uh, when sometimes when he uses the, the word hear, it can describe to understand. 
to understand something. So the NIV here uh, explains a little bit better. They did not understand the voice. Now, they didn't hear the voice in the sense that they didn't understand it. We can even talk about that today. Uh, that, you know, people might be listening, but they're not hearing you, you know, if you, if you understand what I mean. They're not understanding it. They're not getting it. So they heard a voice, but they didn't understand it. And that's how the NIV explains it there in verse 9. And, of course, he asked the question, what shall I do? Now, we talked a little bit about this response uh, a week or two ago because it's similar uh, to what Cornelius was told to do. Uh, the voice didn't tell Saul of Tarsus what to do. It pointed him to a man. Cornelius received a heavenly vision. The, Cornel the heavenly vision, the voice didn't tell Cornelius what to do. The voice told Cornelius to send for Peter, and Peter was going to tell him what to do. Here again, Jesus himself doesn't tell Saul what to do. Jesus says, go to Ananias, and he's going to tell you what to do. You know, it's, it's amazing in the scripture how we always see that it's a person who communicates the good news and tells someone about how to be saved. You remember the story of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. The Ethiopian eunuch was journeying back from Jerusalem, back to Ethiopia. He was the treasurer of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. And he was on his way. The spirit told Philip to join himself to that chariot. Now, the Philip... Uh, the, excuse me, the spirit didn't speak to the eunuch, but the spirit told Philip to speak to the eunuch. And of course, when he got there, he was reading from the prophet Isaiah. Uh, Philip picked up with that very scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And the uh, Ethiopian eunuch was converted. But again, the message was related by a man. In the case of Cornelius, Cornelius was sent, sent for Peter. Peter came and Peter had the words. The men said from Cornelius said, you have words for our master. Peter went and he had the words. Here Jesus himself confronts Saul of Tarsus and he says, go to Ananias in Damascus because Ananias has the words you need to hear. So it's the people who share this gospel message. You know, in 2 Corinthians it talks about we have a, a treasure and, and a vessel of clay and the treasure is the message about the saving grace of Jesus Christ. So Ananias was going to be that messenger and that vessel that preached the gospel to Paul. He said, um, and I asked, who, uh, what shall I do, Lord? I asked, you know, that's similar to Acts uh, 238, 237. They said, men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Here he says, What shall I do, Lord? Get up, said the Lord, and go into Damascus, and there you will be told all that you have been assigned to do. So he was going to go there and meet uh, with Ananias. Verse 11 says, My companions led me by the hand into Damascus, because the brilliance of the light had blinded me. So Paul now went from someone who was completely capable, uh, blessed with vision, to somebody who was blind and had to be led around. Have you ever been associated with any blind people? I've known a couple blind people in my life, uh, several as a matter of fact. And uh, it, it's, it's difficult uh, for a blind person to get around. And it can be done. But certainly they don't have, the, they don't enjoy the mobility that we do. Well, here Paul was confronted with this very real difficulty and problem of being blind. And he had to be led. The brightness of the light affected his eyes. We'll read more about that next week and talk more about that as we get into the rest of the story next week. We're going to conclude here for tonight. Uh, we're going to conclude here with this uh, 13th uh, excuse me, with this 11th verse, and uh, we'll pick up next week with uh, verse 12. You know, God blesses you until then. Let's close a word, with a word of prayer. Our great God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for your holy word. We thank you for uh, Saul of Tarsus, who became our beloved St. Paul.
and one of the greatest evangelists. And, and Father, we just uh, thank you uh, for your love that reaches out to all of us, whatever state we're in, whether we are uh, just apathetic about your church or whether we have antipathy toward your church. Father, we know that your grace still reaches out to us. And Father, today we pray that your grace would reach out to everyone who uh, sees this video and hears these words. Uh, Father, help us to remember uh, that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Father, we thank you for those words. Thank you most of all for Jesus. It's in his most precious and holy name that we pray. Amen.